Good morning, Governor. Morning, Madam Secretary. Uh, to the members of the commission, thank you very much for uh, hosting this hearing and engaging this discussion. Uh, I also want to thank Ray Campbell for his leadership in ensuring that CHIA continues to achieve its vital mission to serve the unique role as the hub of information and analysis about the Massachusetts healthcare system. And my appreciation to our colleagues at the Mass Health Policy Commission, specifically Stuart Altman, who I've known for many years and I know wishes he could be here today, to Marty Cohen as well and the entire board, and to David Seltz and the staff for having me over. The cost trends hearings are an opportunity to convene healthcare leaders, policymakers, and experts to discuss challenges and opportunities to improve healthcare and reduce costs here in Massachusetts. Our administration is committed to serving as a partner in advancing your mission to advance a more transparent, accountable, and innovative healthcare system. As you probably noticed, we filed a pretty comprehensive piece of healthcare reform legislation last week, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. The first part I'm going to talk about is contextual, just to give you some idea about why we chose to do what we did. For the past 50 years, the U.S. healthcare system has been focused primarily on promoting and supporting the technological advancement of medicine. That focus has cured disease, enhanced therapies, and saved lives. However, we failed to appreciate the changing nature of illness and the systemic gaps in care delivery that have been created by this approach. One need look no further than the opioid epidemic to understand what we have missed. The overprescribing of addictive and potentially deadly pain medication brought on by a system which is, in which it is more financially beneficial to write a prescription than it is to provide supportive sustained therapy created an addition, addiction epidemic of gargantuan proportions. While many would argue that the fundamental problems with our healthcare system are rooted in some provider organizations being paid too much and some being paid too little, we would argue the problem is more fundamental than that. Our healthcare system rewards those providers that invest in technology and transactional specialty services at the expense of those who choose to invest in primary care, geriatrics, addiction services, and behavioral health care. This is problematic for three reasons. First, the nature of illness is changing. Chronic illnesses are far more prevalent than they used to be, in part because of the success of modern medicine in solving many acute illnesses over the past five decades. Second, we're an aging population. Many of us who live to an age where brain diseases are far more common, again in part because of our success in treating disease. And third, for a variety of clinical and sociological reasons, mental health addiction and behavioral health issues are far more challenging than they were in the past, and we increasingly recognize how they are intertwined with physical illness, illness these days. Meanwhile, the primary care shortage that was identified over 30 years ago has gotten worse. Simply put, the care delivery and financing system we have today is not designed to take care of the people and the patients we have all become. We pay for a system that's built on transactions and technological advances, not on collaborative care delivery and or therapeutic support. While technological advances remain a critical component of delivering effective health care, a 21st century healthcare system should presume that collaboration and time are at least as important as technology, and that for many people, physical and mental health are related. It should reward providers and provider organizations that invest in a comprehensive set of physical and behavioral health services and understand that population-based health management requires time and connection. Solving this problem at the state level is complicated by the overarching role played by public and private national payers in health care in this country. For the most part, national payers, including Medicare, use payment policies that favor technology and transactional medicine at the expense of primary care, mental and behavioral health and addictional services, and ironically, geriatrics. Almost all providers and payers build their financial models and their operations using this fee schedule as their baseline. This makes any decision to deviate from that model, for example, to offer more mental health services, extremely hard to do. Federal policy and research funding also drive provider organizations to focus on specialty services and care instead of on addiction, mental health, or behavioral health, primary care, or geriatrics. This makes it financially difficult for any care delivery organization to double down in the areas where the greatest gaps in the existing care delivery system exist. 
The legislation we filed on Friday is designed to do many things, but one of them is to create a positive financial incentive for healthcare providers and payers to rethink their service delivery and investment decisions. The bill encourages providers and payers to invest in behavioral health, addiction, recovery, primary care, and geriatric services that are underfunded by today's payment models, incorporate these services more directly into care delivery strategies. Our legislation targets those challenges by requiring investments in behavioral and primary health care and establishing a statewide spending target. Providers and insurers, including MassHealth, will be required to increase spending on behavioral health and primary care by 30% over three years. Calendar year 2019 spending will serve as the baseline, and providers and insurers will be measured on their performance in calendar year 2023. Providers and insurance will be insurers will be required to report annual progress through the frameworks that involve our partners at the HPC and at CHIA. If the target's not achieved, providers and insurance will be referred by CHIA to the HPC and may be subject to a performance improvement plan, which may require them to identify strategies to increase investments in primary care and behavioral health. The legislation proposes these increased investments in primary care and behavioral health while requiring overall spending to stay within the parameters of the state's overall health care cost growth benchmark, understanding the importance of the process that exists here that continues to control costs on a global basis. This will be a break from the trajectory of the past several decades and may cause some modest disruptions, but it's the right direction for our payment systems and providers if we want to create a payment and care delivery system that serves our people in the most cost-effective and appropriate way possible. Our bill also builds on the foundation laid by the 2012 cost containment legislation. As we heard earlier, recent efforts have yielded moderate success in bending the health care cost growth curve. However, rising health care costs disproportionately affect individuals and employers as increases in premiums and cost sharing continue to outpace overall expenditures. To address year-over-year -year increases in pharmacy spend, the legislation seeks to hold high drug cost manufacturers accountable through a similar HPC framework for payers and providers who exceed the benchmark, to penalize manufacturers for excessive price increases, and establish new oversight authority of PBMs. By the way, something that's present in more than half the states in the United States. The bill also includes several consumer protections and measures to reduce consumers' out-of-pocket costs, including prohibitions on surprise billing practices and facility fees, and reforms promoting access to more affordable, innovative health plans for individuals and employers alike. The bill also requires accurate provider directories for consumers to secure behavioral health appointments and for pharmacists to always offer the lowest cost available prescription. Further, a stable and affordable insurance market is key to maintaining our near universal coverage levels and a well-functioning healthcare system. To address many of the emerging federal policy changes and the dynamics that may impact the Massachusetts Merge market, last Friday I also signed an executive order establishing an advisory council to conduct an independent actuarial analysis of the merge market and provide recommendations by April of 2020. Finally, this legislation promotes access to quality, coordinated care, and modernizes policies to bring Massachusetts in line with other states and areas where we've lagged. These measures include removing outdating practice restrictions for mid-level clinicians, creating a new mid-level dental therapist, standardizing urgent care services, and advancing telemedicine through aligned regulatory and coverage policies. It would seem to me that since we invented telemedicine, it's probably time for us to legalize it. <laughs> Managing ex excess costs and promoting increased access to vital services will support the recalibration of our healthcare financing and delivery system toward a model that values time and positive outcomes and meets the evolving needs of our patient population. Many of the reforms we propose will also reduce costs, including to patients and small businesses while maintaining the quality of care Massachusetts deserves. We're grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with the HPC and look forward to a productive dialogue with you and with our legislative colleagues as this conversation on this bill and others moves forward. Thank you.